God with that kind of special musical offering, it, it, it does something to you. And I just, I, I tell you, my heart was stirred to see a mother and a daughter sing that together. You know, that's why it's so important for us to continue, you know, to lead our children in the way of the pathway to the Lord so that they will not move away or deviate from that. You know, I'm looking at the clock. We have so much to cover and so much to say that I'm just going to have to jump into this. But before I do, just want to uh, hit the rewind button just quickly. Last week, we made an appeal for those of you who would like to consider following in the footsteps of Jesus and pursue baptism. If you would like to explore baptism, we are having a class that's dedicated to putting you on that pathway. We're going to be meeting, I think it was mentioned earlier, in the Sabbath school room, the Sabbath school classroom right out of this door, the first one on your left as you head to the bathrooms, uh, where the women's, uh, uh, you know, get together to study uh, during the morning Sabbath school time. So if you are interested in getting on that pathway, come and join us. We're going to be there this afternoon. Uh, I think you're going to be blessed. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into our message we've entitled this morning with w- single word help, uh, which is in keeping with our series on on the, cult- on the counterculture shock of the John the Baptist generation. John the Baptist generation. Let's pray together. Father, This morning, we have been in worship from the moment that we arrived. But now, as we transition into your word through this message, may you guard our hearts so that we may live for Jesus. Purify and refine us that we might be holy for Jesus and do his will as we ask it in the name of your son. Amen. You know, I want to begin this morning with a little disclosure uh, you know, b- living in, in on the East Coast, New York City primarily, I've seen a lot of ads. I'm not sure. Have you ever seen the, the small print on those ads? Have you? I mean, th- this seems to be germane to, to advertising. But l- you listen long enough to advertisements. You can listen to it on the radio or wherever. And you discover quickly, as I did living in New York City, that when Madison Avenue, when they want to push and roll out the new and improved, the grand product, it, it, which is, they, it's required that they do something during that commercial. You know what they have to do, right? At the end of the commercial, they put in small print, which is kind of required by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. They say that you must issue... In that same ad, all of the disclaimers, you know, all of the warnings, all of the exceptions to what that company just promoted. If you're listening on the radio to any kind of announcer who's actually promoting that ad, right? He or she who at that moment, their voice goes into overdrive. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, have you? No, no. It's like Mach 2. I mean, twice the speed of sound, and, and which, of course, is intentional because you won't hear a thing that they're actually saying about the 20 loopholes that pretty much dissolves the entire ad. And I've observed that on the subject of what we're going to talk about this morning, which is on the screen, I believe that what is arguably, I believe, the most, that is probably the most sensitive topic within our Christian Adventist community of faith. You know why health and diet is the most sensitive topic? You know why? Because it is a red-hot, hot potato. That's why. I mean, and, and there's nothing that stirs up a, a judgmental spirit more than diet. You know, that's the reason why skinny people, they can get to judging heavy people. And why vegetarians can get to judging carnivores. And why no dessert vegetarian can get to judging dessert vegetarians. And why no dessert in between meal vegetarians can get to judging dessert and in between meal vegetarian. And why vegans, they just judge us all. (laughs) I mean, that's just how it is. Which is why when it comes to diet, 
we need to read the fine print. And I'm going to roll it out here for you this morning in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now, it's scribbled right in his manuscript to the church in Rome. But even though we may think it's small, it's actually in big letters. We just refer to it as the small print. But here, it's actually in big letters. Go to the 12th book in the New Testament written to the Roman church, Romans chapter 12. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 14. Here in Romans chapter 14, we're going to put the first small print. It's just a non-disclaimer at the end. Instead of putting it at the end of our message, we're going to put it front and center. We're going to put it in your face this morning before we jump into our message, okay? Before diving into our sermon, here's the disclaimer. Are you ready? Let's read it. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, but it doesn't matter if you don't have that. We're going to put it on the screen, but follow along in your translation so you can get the maximum benefit from the Bible. And so notice what the Apostle Paul says, Romans 14, beginning in 1. Accept other Christians who are weak in the faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servant? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his what? His approval. I mean, with the small print, I want this to be the small print warning in your mind. Because I want us to realize that Paul here, he's flagging us away from doing what? What is he telling us not to do? Not to judge. He says, look, don't judge, particularly in the area of diet. But Jesus then comes along, and what does he do on the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew chapter 7? He waves us away from judging altogether, period. He says, don't do it. Don't judge, he says in Matthew chapter 7. Otherwise, you're going to be judged. All right, with that small little disclaimer, the the little small print warning tucked away now, you know, here in the recesses of your mind, let's plunge into this red hot subject that is critical for this John the Baptist generation. Now, I want you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. It's from the life of John the Baptist. We've been on this journey, this series, leading through this John the Baptist generation because remember, John the Baptist is a type. He represents those who will be living in the last days. And so just like John the Baptist was waiting for the coming of the Messiah, we are waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Yes or no? Oh, come on now, folks. Are you waiting? Do you believe in the second coming? Yes or no? Amen. That's right. We're waiting for the second coming of Jesus. So we are that next generation of a John the Baptist. And so let's pick it up in Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and he was preaching his message of repentance. Repentance of your sins to turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, He is the voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. But this is where we're going to park. We're going to park in verse 4 for a little bit, if not for the rest of the duration of our message. Verse 4 says, But John, he clothed himself, and he wore from for his clothes coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate what? Locusts and what, everyone? Locusts and honey. Now, did you catch? I want you to notice what's happening here. Did you catch that wilderness diet of John the Baptist? I I mean, can you imagine somebody trying to sell that diet to America today? I mean, can you? I'll tell you the truth. You know, as gullible as Americans can sometimes be, I predict that they would actually buy this diet. Yeah, there's locusts and honey. 
as long as it's covered in chocolate, I'll eat it. Right? I mean, I, I'll eat it. I mean, someone, someone recently told me that that menu of locusts and honey can actually fit into the Atkins diet. Yeah, 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 it can. Believe it or not. Here it is. High protein. That would be the locust. Okay? And unrefined sugar, that would be the honey. You see, well, what we're going to look at, and I want you to understand here, is that everyone here this morning in the hearing of my voice knows honey, right? I mean, you know it comes for extract from the bees, and they put it in their little, you know, hive. Everyone knows honey, right? You guys know honey, yes or no? Okay, good. I'm going to go on. But what about the locusts? What are these locusts? Actually, you need to know that there is quite a bit of scholarly debate over just what these locusts were that John was eating. What is this guy imbibing on? Well, the Greek word there is interesting. It's aridis. And that word is used everywhere in the Bible. And it's also used in contemporary literature. In Greek literature and everywhere else refers to the insect. Yeah, that little grasshopper. Boing, 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 boing. Yeah, that little grasshopper, right? And you also need to know that locusts, they have a part of the diet in the people in the Middle East from ancient time even today. In fact, if you go, we're not going to have time, but if you were to go to God's dietary menu in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, you'll discover that certain locusts is defined by God as fit for human consumption. Yeah, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking right now, oh, come on, Pastor Frank, great. You mean to tell me that John the Baptist was munching on little Jiminy Cricket grasshoppers for his diet? (laughs) Well, one can come to that conclusion for this text. However, and this is a huge however, okay, that when you look at, for example, the Bible commentary that is promoted by the ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It deals with eight lengthy but persuasive reasons why the early church fathers and many of contemporary scholars, they conclude that, in fact, that locus here refers to the Suetonia Siliqua. That is the the Latin scientific name for the carob tree. The carob tree. Yeah. And so if you're from Germany or from England, they'll tell you that it actually still refers to St. John's bread. Yeah. The carob pod. In, in fact, in Arabic today, it's still called locust. You know why? Because it has, you know, these, the, the horns like protrusion, which is why the Greeks, they still refer to the carob pod as little horns, just like a horned locust. Now, instead of going to those eight historical convincing arguments in the in the Bible commentary that we put out, instead, I want to share with you instead just a single line written more than a century ago that suggests that indeed it may have been the carrot fruit. I'm going to take you there to those words written in the councils of health. Let's put it on the screen. The author Ellen White says this. She says, John's diet purely what everyone vegetable of locusts and wild honey was a rebuke to the indulgence of appetite and the gluttony that everywhere prevailed and so a vegetarian diet of carapods and wild honey that john the baptist ate it's enough to send you oh really i mean what's up with that but i want to enter now into a study that's going to just blow you away. It was done by an American, um, by an American diet internationally. This American diet and internationally mortality rates, and it comes from this book that was written by George Furman. I'm going to spend a bulk of our time here with some quotes I want to share with you. This author... Dr. Furman, board-certified physician who specializes in preventing and reversing diseases through nutritional and natural met- through natural, natural methods. His book is entitled Eat to Live. Eat to Live. A great book. I recommend it. I can summarize. In fact, that's what we're going to do. He gives some fascinating but yet troubling conclusions in this book, but it can best be summarized with two graphs. How many graphs did I just say? 
I'm going to show you two graphs for, you, for, your, uh, for your viewing this morning. We're going to put them on the screen in just a moment. But before we do, I want you to take a careful look at the graphs because they're extremely troubling but yet compelling. Graph number one is entitled U.S. Food Consumption by Calories. This is a graph, and I want you to look at it. Don't look at me. Look at the graph. This is a graph of the United States food consumption by calories that we as Americans actually consume. We're constantly taking in. Now, notice what percentage of our diet goes to this and that and the other. Look, you know, you can't, I think you can see the legend pretty well. But the first one is 63%. It's made up of refined and processed food. Now, that's the largest segment of that pie. Think about this. 63% of the American uh, <clears throat> calories that they're constantly taking in, the American diet comes from that segment, refined and processed food. That will simply be bread, pastas, cakes, cookies, pizza, chips, donuts, candy, fast food, pastries, you know, Food that's basically created by mixing flour and sugar and oil in a bowl. In other words, it's everything that you guys like to eat. Isn't that true? Come on now. Come on, 63%. Are you in that number? No. Okay, well, not far behind, not far behind, 25% of the caloric intake that is dairy and animal foods. Notice this, 25%, because we consume this dairy animal products as well. Notice what this is. This is basically what? Meat, fish, milk, butter, sour cream, cheese, pizza and nachos, ice cream, milk, chocolate. This is everything that the average teenager and the young adults love to eat. Yeah. So that's just 25% of the American diet. And it's only the one last segment left. Which is the last segment? Can you see it? Yeah, the 12%, which is actually divided in half because it might be processed. So really what you're left with is only 6%. 6% is devoted in the American diet to fruits and vegetables. Can you imagine that? Fruits and vegetables? This would be fiber-rich, fresh fruits, leafy plants, garden field vegetables, beans, whole grains, raw nuts, and seeds. And by the way, even that number, even this number, even though it looks higher than it really is, it's not. I'm going to quote here from Furman in his book. He's actually saying that almost all, he says, almost all of the vegetables consumed in this study are potatoes, and half of the potatoes consumed are in the forms of fries and chips. <laughs> fries and chips. Think about this. He, you know, he says, look, potatoes are one of the least nutritious vegetables. The same studies that show anti-cancer effects of leafy green vegetables and fruits and beans suggest that potatoes, heavy diets are not healthy and show a positive association with colon cancer. Excluding potatoes, Americans consume a mere 5% of their calories from fruits, vegetables, and legumes. I mean, this is not exactly the kind of diet you want to write home about. We're being killed by the small print. You know why? This is why. And he actually now concludes, and I'm going to put this on the screen. For, Dr. Furman says, from, from convenience foods to fast food restaurants, our fast-paced society has divorced itself from healthy eating. The result is that we are sicker than ever. And now, he says, our, mo our medical costs are skyrocketing out of control. He says, I insist that our low consumption of unrefined plant food is largely responsible for our dismal mortality statistics. Most of us perish prematurely as a result of dietary folly. Do you agree with that, yes or no? Let that sink in your mind for a moment. Because if that graph does not make a believer out of you right now, I promise you the second one will. I'm going to put the second one on the screen, the second graph. This is unrefined plant food consumption versus the killer diseases. Now, this is a planet-wide, a, a global study that they did. 
Uh, and of course, the killer disease that someone recently told me, Pastor, I thought that was COVID-19. No, it's not COVID-19. Killer diseases, number one is cancer. How many people here have known someone who died of cancer recently? A lot of them do. Second one is heart disease. So this graph is charting 12 nations and their relationship to the killer diseases of heart disease and cancer. The two top killers, cancer disease. Now notice this. unrefined plant food versus the disease, the killer ones. You can't see it that well there, but if you look at the, 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 the bars, the consumption of vegetables, fruits, and leafy greens, if you look at it, the death rate of heart disease and cancer, it starts on... It starts on the left. You can see where it starts with Hungary. U.S. is the next one. Right after and so forth and so on. But notice what happens as, it's, as, it, as you move through the graph. Know carefully that the consumption of fruits and vegetable increases the national mortality rate. Those killer diseases dramatically decrease. You see, do you see it happening there? It's going in the opposite direction. The more vegetables they eat, the lower you go. Look at Thailand and Laos. Look at how low they are. I mean, that's amazing. This is why Dr. Furman, he concludes this way. He says, based on the exhaustive look at research data from around the world for over the past 15 years, he says, my recommendation is that your diet should contain over 90% of calories from unrefined plant foods. Yes, I know. He says, in the diet allows us to predict freedom from cancer, heart attacks, diabetes, and excess body, body weight. F- fruits, vegetables, beans must, he says, must be the base of your food pyramid. Otherwise, you will be in a heap of trouble down the road. I mean, folks, recently, I mean, think about this. He says, when you think about this, the, 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 what he's putting out, this data, it's compelling enough to actually remind us that the divine diet that was given to the human race in the beginning at creation, it still remains these, a millennial later, the most successful prediction and predictor of human longevity and optimal health. There's nothing better than that. God gave it to us in the beginning, and it's still relevant now today. You don't need this guy to actually prove it to you. You just need to believe it. And see, God had it right from the beginning, and we're the ones in the end and don't have it right, unfortunately. And I know you're thinking, oh, come on, Pastor. Really? On Sabbath? You know, I'm a vegetarian. You know, I'm, I'm actually fine, thank you. Okay. All right, so here's a question, Mr. Vegetarian or Mrs. Vegetarian. How much animal products do you consume? Cheese, ice cream, butter, sour cream. Are those all animal products, yes or no? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. In fact, I'm going to add this slide. Let's put this on the screen. Notice what Dr. Furman says. He says, following a strict vegetarian diet is not important as eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables a vegetarian whose diet is mainly refined refined grains cold breakfast cereals processed helpful store products vegetarian fast foods white rice and pasta will be worse off than a person who eats a little chicken or eggs for, for, for instance but consumes a large amount of fruits vegetables and beans <laughs> Did you understand what Furman is saying? I don't think you caught it. You know what he's saying? He actually just described, ladies and gentlemen, the typical Adventist diet. In fact, no, no, correction. He's actually describing the typical Seventh-day Adventist potluck. Oh, no, 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 Pastor. You did not go there. We do not eat meat. That's right. But instead of not eating meat, we make up for it when we consume an inordinate amount of animal dairy products, vegetarian fast food, refined sugar desserts. You know, you know what they're discovering now? Believe this or not. Teenage girls right now. And now let me hit you guys up. For, I, I don't want to 
you know, put you on the spot right now. But teenage girls, they're no longer drinking milk and no longer drinking water. So they spend a large amount of time consuming pop, soda pop. And they're setting themselves up for an early onset of osteoporosis. That's just that what they're finding right now, you know. And, and so when we consume an inordinate amount of animal products, vegetarian fast food, refined sugar desserts, processed health food, what about this one? Salty, salty fake meats, refined bread, fi- you know, fiberless pasta. And many of us, if we're honest, many of us will have to admit that cheese has become the next stable. That, that's our Adventist meat, actually. It's cheese. And, and, and let, me, let me share this quote, what Dr. Furman says about this particular product. He says here, he says, cheese has more saturated fat and more hormone containing and promoting substance than any other food. And the incident of our hormonally sensitive cancers has skyrocketed, leading Furman to conclude that it is the most dangerous food in the world to consume. Though it tastes good, it does. It does taste good. It should be used very rarely, if at all. Now, I know, listen, let me tell you, folks, I'm actually stepping on my own toes here like crazy. I really am. And I know, I know. But let me tell you that we have far too long, we've hidden behind our vegetarian front. Hey, I'm a vegetarian. You know, and, and, and the problem is our vegetarian front. It's extending further and further and further. The time has come to really prayerfully consider the implications of this relaxed vegetarian diet that we have corporately and individually embraced. That's just the truth. Let me tell you what the research has shown. He says the research shows that those who avoid meat and dairy have lower rates of heart disease, cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity. The data is conclusive. Vegetarians live longer in America, probably a lot longer. We know that, but do we practice it? You see, the reason why this is so vital, why it's so important for us to take seriously because of the skyrocketing evidence for a diet dominated by fruits, vegetables, beans, and grains. Let me, I'm going to now close with the last quote from his book. And notice what he says. Dr. Furman says, The diseases that afflict and eventually kill almost all Americans can be what, everyone? Can be what, everyone? Can be avoided. You can live a high-quality, disease-free life and remain physically active and healthy. You can die peacefully, uneventfully, at an old age as nature intended. I mean, isn't that beautiful? I could tell you, that's beautiful. Look, look, I, 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 I'm going to wrap up the quote. He says, to achieve the results in preventing and reversing diseases... And attaining premature health body weight, we must be concerned with the nutritional quality of our diet. Now, question for you, maybe for me. What does this have to do with John the Baptist generation? Besides the locust and the honey. What does this have to do with the John the Baptist generation? You want to know what? It has everything to do with the John the Baptist generation. Listen up, because this is where it gets good. It has everything to do with them. Do you know why? Because the John the Baptist generation is actually teaching us that what we eat and drink is truly a mortal issue and a moral issue. Diet is a moral issue. And I want to close by giving you two reasons. How many reasons did I just say? Two reasons why diet for you and me is a moral issue. Are you ready? It's a moral issue for the, gen, for the John the Baptist generation, what we eat and drink. Number one, reason one, my diet concerns God's call to what, everyone? To holiness. That's point number one. Point number two is that you are a temple. I am God's temple. Take a look at this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul eloquently emphasizes this point. He does it far better than I can ever do. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 15. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually part of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say, the two are united into one, but the person who is joined to the Lord in one spirit with him, run, he says, run away from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? He lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. So when we were bought with a high price, what kind of price was that, everyone? High High price. How high was it? It cost them every drop, every coagulated blood in him. The last blood of Christ was was used to buy you. You were blood bought. I want you to remember this. Someone bought your bodies. We are blood bought so that those scars that we see on Jesus, he reminds us, I bought you. You are mine. I freed you at Calvary. And at Calvary, I gave myself wholly to you so that you can then give yourself wholly to me. I own you so that you can be set free. You know, I love the way the book of Romans puts this. Romans, when he talks about this ownership. In Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, he says, And so, my dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, he says, I plead with you. I'm going to look at this up. Instead of quoting it, I'm going to read it to you. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. Here it is. Paul says, I'm pleading with you to give your bodies to God because all he has done for you. Let them be a living, holy sacrifice. The kind of will, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy Do not copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and and perfect. When God says, think about this, when God says you are designed for optimal, for the optimal body to operate efficiently with this particular diet, He's not trying to be a party pooper on your parade. He's not trying to say, hey, hey, oh, you know, I'm not going to be doing this and that. He's not trying to, you know, rain down or be a Debbie Downer. Pardon me if someone's named Debbie. Okay. He's not trying to be down on you. He's trying to ensure you that you can live on the cutting edge of human existence. His perfect will, he says here, how pleasing He says, you can allow, you cannot allow your appetite to rule you with abandon. What goes in your mouth more frequently than anything else is a moral issue, which is why when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, I'm just going to quote it. We don't have time. He says, therefore, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, do it to the glory of whom? Do it to the glory of God. Reason number two. Here it is. I'm going to move at hyperspeed now. Mark 2. Reason number two, my diet concerns God's call for what? For readiness. For readiness. That's point number one. Point number two, that readiness is coupled hand in hand because you're God's witness. Just like he did with John the Baptist, God is calling for the John the Baptist generation to become fitted for his strategic mission and purpose. To get ready, he says, make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Get ready, world, for his soon coming Messiah is on the cusp. That's our mission. That's our mission. And our bodies need to be in optimal condition in constant availability. Do you understand what I'm saying here? What I'm saying is what Edson told you earlier, but I'm expanding on it, that your body needs to be in optimal health. Otherwise, how are they going to give out books? 
if your body is not functioning, how are you going to share the Christ love of Jesus with others because you are, you, 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 your body is not functioning? This is the reason why this generation cannot afford to find sluggish, half-dead, inebriated, mentally distracted by physical, preventable, preventable, preventable dysfunction and diseases. Otherwise, how can we work for the cause of Christ? Christ is saying, I need you. He says, I need you, says God. He says, go for me. Go for me. But like the great cross section of the world we live in, in America, because of our diet, we are physically debilitated, mentally dysfunctional, and spiritually dying. To what generation? Ask yourself this. To what generation is God supposed to turn to? What generation is he going to turn to? He will have to wait for the next generation? You think he's going to wait? Folks, God does not have to wait. I believe that the next generation, this John the Baptist generation, is here. It's right here in front of me, and you're it. Believe it or not, you don't have to wait for those, you know, for that graph to continue to extend and be another statistic or to drive those bars even higher. Will, will we just wait? Will we just wait for our kids? Let me, let's punt that off to my son or to my daughter. Let them be the generation. No, you are the John the Baptist generation. I mean, come on. What was the message that the angel Gabriel gave to the father, Zechariah, before his son was born? Do you remember what that was? Do you? Come on now. Do you remember? Because it is the focus of our series. It's in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. What does it say? To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That was the message Zechariah gave them. We are the people to make ready in order for others to see the coming of Christ. You know, I, I need you to lock this in your mind. I really do. I need you to lock it in now and think through this moment with me. It's precisely that readiness that makes our diet deeply a moral issue. Now, remember the small, because everything is in the small print. We are being called not to judge one another. We're not called to judge one another. Each of us must answer to God individually. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, we must, we have to confront our own carelessness with diet and our inability to control our own appetites. You know, our, I'm going to say this, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to close with one last quote. Our out of control diet is truly and deeply a moral issue. Why? Because I rob God. I steal from him. If I, he, when he looks at me, he says, you have five more years in your life and you burnt yourself by the stuff that you have done. If I take what God has given me, what he's invested in me, and I squander that, then it's robbery, isn't it? How many of you take an investment and squander it, they're going to come after you for pilfering. Remember the small print. The only diet that you must answer to is your own. You hear what I'm saying? The only diet you need to answer to is your own. And the only appetite you must control is your own. Just like John the Baptist, that lean diet of honey and crickets. But put that aside. I'm going to end with this last quote. It's precisely this readiness that makes our diets and the control of our appetite deeply a moral issue. Let's put it on the screen. From the desire of ages, she says, in preparing the way for Christ's first advent, John was a representative of those who are to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. The world is given to self-indulgence. She's actually shifting from John to now to us. She says, the world is giving to self-indulgence. Errors, fables abound. You know, I read this and, you know, this blows my mind away. You know why? Because how many times has the food industry has just really catered to your based appetites? 
I mean, think about it. Have, don't they do that when they go and they, they just cater to you and say, hey, you know what? You can, you, you, are you hungry? We're actually open to 1 a.m. The bell still rings for you. The bell still rings for you. And you know what? You're kind of hungry. Why don't you go get a little snack at 1 a.m. And, and, you know, just before you go to bed so that your stomach can continue to stay working and not get any rest so that your body will be completely eating, 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 eating. Because the devil knows that, hey, I can control you not just through your appetite, but through those snacks every time without your stomach. As long as you're eating 24-7, 365, you're young, just continue to do that because I'm going to have the victory over this generation one way or another. Think about that. I mean, let that sink in your mind. But she continues. She says, Satan's snares for destroying souls are multiplied. All who, all who would perfect holiness in the fear of God must learn the lessons of temperance and self-control. What is temperance? Temperance is just simply, uh, you know, controlling. It's, it's self-control, controlling that intake, that appetite. But she continues, that appetite and passions must be held in subjection to the higher powers of the mind. This self-discipline is essential to the mental strength and spiritual insight which will enable us to understand and practice the sacred truths of God's word. For this reason, temperance, temperance finds its place in the work of preparation for the what, everyone? For the second coming. For the second coming. I tell you, temperance is just self-control. That's it. Self-control. Controlling appetite, it finds its work in reason number two, holiness and readiness. Just like John, just like John. No, forget about John. Forget about John. How about like Jesus? How about like Jesus? Did you guys just hear when Irma and Daniel were singing? Daniel was singing about whom? They were singing about Jesus. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. Seated on the throne. He, it is because of him, his worthiness, like Jesus, who offered himself up on the cross that after, during that earthly ministry, he did not eat for 40 days and 40 nights. And he was on the verge, you know, and all of a sudden the devil walks in after that and he begins to tempt them with drink, eat to Christ. And what did he say? What did he say? It is written, one does not live by what? No, by the power of appetite. One does not live by the power of appetite alone, but by the word of God that proceeded out of his mouth. And what's the word of God? The word of God says that your body does not belong to you. Obey my will. And your life will be radically different. I'm going to call my, let, let's get the praise team up. I, I'm way over, you know, let, let's call them up because I want to go ahead and close now. We're, I want to pray. I, I can keep going, but uh, 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 I'm kind of afraid to do so. But I want to have prayer with you right now because I suspect that many of us will struggle with this particular issue in our lives. Health and diet is, is, is a very sensitive topic for many of us. And so we're going to ask that the Lord, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, give you the power to be able to overcome. Do you want that in your life? Do you want to be able to overcome that? Let's pray. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, Father, right now, we're asking, we're appealing for you to do what we struggle to do. It's difficult, Father, to control our appetite. Look at, after all, look at what happened to Adam and Eve. They couldn't do it, and they were perfect. Here we are, living on the cusp of the second coming. Can you give us the strength to do so? And so this morning, I want to ask you, if you're interested in God giving you the strength through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to be able to live that holiness and work in and through your diet and appetite, I want to invite you to stand with me right now. If that's your desire, stand, not because I'm asking you, but because you want, you want God to give you the power through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to have that victory. If that's what you want, stand to your feet with me right now because I'm, I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to anoint you with strength and power to move forward on the basis of that appeal because we cannot do it alone. Let's stand if you want, but don't do it because I'm asking. Do it because the Lord wants to work in and through your heart to do so. Father, I want to thank you for this time.
and bless us as we continue to wrap this up as we ask this in the name of your